Can we continue to let three to five people a week overdose and multiple people dying a week? That's what we're averaging here. Youth is a happy time and a carefree time. A time of auto rides and double dates. Addiction to drugs, too often acquired with tragic carelessness, may take control of a life and force actions not dreamed of before. These addicts, life's only work is to find money for drugs. In their desperation, no means is too foul. Their only goal in life is to keep the deadening chemicals forever in their heart's blood. There is a war at our doorstep, a crisis slowly taking over our neighborhoods and communities for decades. While it destroys families and claims more than 100,000 lives each year. Since the year 2000, drug overdoses have increased an alarming 137% with no signs of slowing down. We've heard it called the war on drugs and it's a war that knows no discrimination and has no age limitations. It is silently stealing away sons and daughters, mothers and fathers. It has affected us all in some way. It's touched your life, whether you realize it or not. So how do we extend hope to such a growing epidemic? When I heard about Hohenwald, I knew it was a story that must be told. When I was doing drugs, it was, a, it was different. Back then, you could, you could take drugs and it, it wouldn't kill you. I mean, you could do about anything you wanted to do. In short term, you could live through it. Long term, it may kill you, but short term, you didn't have to worry about dying when they give you something. That's why if they give you one, you could take two or three, whatever you wanted to do, and you didn't have to worry about dying. The thing that's changed today is one time can cost you your life. We've just here recently, we had one uh, senior in high school two weeks ago that was 18 years old, who, um, not that I have known, has had a drug problem, but had decided somebody gave him something, he took it, sat down in a chair, and that was it, so. And that's what a lot of people don't understand. One time, and it's over now. They're, what they're bringing across the border today and bringing into these cities, it's killing their babies. Most of the people that are dying in this community, they didn't mean to die. They just got, they just got a hold of bad drugs and uh, thinking it was something else when it wasn't. And that's what's killing our babies today. Let me tell you a story from my own family. My closest cousin overdosed on drugs when he was 16 years of age. We rushed to his bedside because we didn't know if he would live through the night. And we prayed that God would spare his life. But he battled addiction for the next 15 to 20 years of his life. Then after doing a stint in prison, he got out. He was doing so well, he was working, he was going to church. We thought he'd all turned the corner. And God's going to provide quail, and God's going to provide manna, but sometimes he will allow a physical need to develop you spiritually. I'll tell you something. We've lost a lot of people through addiction in our ministry. My family has suffered, and I love you. And I'm going to tell you something. I don't care how much you go to church, and I want you here. You are in the right place in a lot of ways. I want you here. 
I want you to be faithful. It doesn't matter how much you come to church, how much you read the Bible. If you do not change your surroundings, you're never going to get better. you got to change your phone number, man. <laughs> I don't care if it's friends. I don't care if it's family. I don't care who it is. You've got to walk away from toxic people because the Bible says, can two walk together except they be agreed? The law of gravity will tell you, Donnie, that it's easier for them to pull you down than it is for you to pull them up. You've got to change your friends. And you do it, and I promise you, God's going to change your life. And I'm proud of you. And I'm here. I'm your shepherd, man. Yeah. And I'm here for the long haul. But I want to see you prosper and grow in the Lord. Can I pray for you? Yeah. And guide him. Give him new friends. Give him new family. Give him new resolve to want to serve you and you alone. Change his life, we pray, in Jesus' name. He called me and said, Carrie, I'm doing great. I said, I'm so glad to hear it. I'm so happy that things are working out for you. But my friend, sadly, he couldn't overcome the cravings. And a week later, his own son and another friend brought him drugs. And they went into an apartment and they all shot heroin into their arms. And then his son and, and the other fellow left to go buy some food. And while they were gone, my cousin needed another hit. So he shot more heroin into his body instantly stopped his heart and took his life. He didn't need to die. But this tragic story is also the tragic tale for thousands of families throughout America. I kind of lost my way in high school started dabbling in little things, drinking. Then that led to, to drugs and just anything they would hand me, you know, I would pretty well take it, no questions. Just if one was good, two was better. My name is Richie Garber. Uh, I was raised in Waverly. Uh, I started getting involved in drugs and alcohol. Late high school, brother got killed on his motorcycle. And um, that's where I walked away from God. I went deeper into drugs and alcohol to numb the pain. We had a six-year-old six son, four-year-old son, two-year-old daughter that was born into that marriage. Um, first time ever we had Christmas pictures made. Uh, we're coming back, we're going back uh, home, an 18-wheeler comes across the center line. Hits his head on, it kills my wife and my two sons, six and four. My name is Tim Cottom, and uh, I'm a 35 plus year recovering addict. Of course, I've been to prison two times. The second time when I got out, uh, of course, I went right back to using again. And My name is Vic Nichols, Jr., 2016, 2017. So where the story begins. I had had a 10 year strike of sobriety. Um, I'd gotten married, had custody of my twins, my twin daughters. Um, buried my father in 2010 from cancer. I buried my closest sister in 2008 from an overdose on Oxycontin. At about 16, I started self-medicating. Um, to hide the bipolar symptoms. I was given a lot of medications at an early age, which really set me up to start self-medicating every single time I had something that I couldn't deal with. Uh, I did not like myself. I would have to take five pills to get up in the morning and then five pills to put me down at night. And that is how my life was. And I thought it was completely normal. I thought that medications were, you're supposed to take medications. If they're from a doctor, it's okay. And eventually I got up to like two Xanax bars a day. And um, the doctor was like, I just don't know why we're having this breakthrough anxiety. I, my name is Charles Lovell. I'm from Kentucky. It's no question really why I ever got into drugs because my whole family does drugs. Uh, they all uh, have been to prison for drugs multiple times. 
My whole family's in prison at this moment for drugs, except for the ones that have already gotten out. I have um, always lived in that environment, been from that chaotic lifestyle. Uh, me and my brother and sisters, I have, I'm the oldest of seven, so I grew up kind of quick taking care of them. My name is Sam Livingston. Uh, I'm the pastor of Highland Baptist Church. My full-time job is I'm the director of the 21st Judicial District Drug Task Force, which is, is Lewis County is one of the counties that we have jurisdiction over. The crystal meth hit our community like it did all of Tennessee and Middle Tennessee. Um, we had a lot uh, back several years ago, there was a lot of labs. Um, I think we were sixth or seventh in the state at one time with, with how many labs that, that our guys were able to, between us and the Sheriff's Department, in the task force was able to come in and, and make busts and clean up the labs. Uh, they did a lot of shake and bakes, which were just bottles that we'd have laying all over our community uh, in the last few years. A lot of the meth is being brought in, but the crystal meth just came on hard and strong. Crystal meth is not a new drug. It's been around uh, for ages. It, it used to be called crank uh, years ago because the motorcycle industry controlled it, and they would keep it in the crankcases of their bikes. And, and how it's changed is it used to be literally made by chemists, um, and now you, you can go on the Internet, and it, it's just it's, it's terrible um, what it does. And it's, it's, it's such a false false high, I guess I should say, because uh, with, with the chemicals that work in your body, you're always chasing that first high and you'll never get it again. Um, and it, it's just to watch people go through it. it. It just destroys people's lives. It destroys communities. As a pastor, that something had to be done because, as, you know, when you're sitting in, in a position as a pastor, we're considered the watchman on the wall. And we can't continue to let our babies die, our sons and daughters and our mothers and dads die and be on the wall and do nothing. For every person we lost, and we've lost some really good people, but for every person we've lost, you've got to say, yeah, but there's so many more that we haven't. And everybody, I, I, just, I just think everybody deserves a chance. Everybody has problems. But I feel like the medications did it opposite. I remember thinking when I was 17, I was like, this can't be normal. Why do I feel this way all the time? Why do I feel like I'll never be good enough? Why do I feel like this is never going to end? It ultimately led to me just self-isolating and then self-medicating even worse. And that's when I started going outside of the medications. And that's what folks miss. We can, we can look at, at, at the, we can look the, at the meth and we can look at the heroin and we can look at that. We can look at all those things and say, oh, you know, that's a problem. But you know, people who sit and read a book every day and don't engage in, in, in dialogue with people or don't engage the real world, they're living in a, that's an addiction. Uh, anyone who, anything that you do that props you up and, and, and you use as a shield or crutch not to do something, that's an addiction. The sin that easily besets you. And what that tells me is everybody's unique, everybody has an issue, and some, some folks' issues, they'll take their life. It's nothing like we've ever seen. 90, 97% uh, once you get on the drug, 97% is an addiction rate. And we've literally watched it transform our community like we have every other community. You know, because each one of us, our families, um, our friends have all been affected by my drugs and alcohol. When I heard about Hohenwald, Tennessee, I knew it was a story that must be told. These people decided that enough was enough, and they agreed that it was time to fight the war instead of sitting on the sidelines, watching their community fall victim to the battle. In this one small city in Middle Tennessee, 12 churches joined forces across denominational barriers and didn't just preach the gospel, 
but together they became the gospel for their city and for America. Um, I've grown up in Hohenwald my entire life. Uh, this is one of my favorite places. It is home for me. So this is very special to me. I grew up in a wonderful family, a normal family, as you would say. Um, my aunt was the librarian at the high school and uh, my grandmother was the librarian in the county. I went to the library every day after school. Um, I also went to a lot of uh, therapy, dealing with the things that abuse that happened to me when I was younger. And that's kind of what set the stage for the medication to start being poured into me. I, I don't ever believe that it was on purpose. I think that they were legitimately trying to help me with whatever they could. But um, <laughs> I was very psychotic for a long time. And the more the medications kept coming, the more those, uh, they called me psycho, see? It was like these episodes where I would lose it and I would end up getting arrested or I would get in trouble at school or something really bad because I would just, all of this would just come flying out of me and I never knew how to properly deal with it. So when the medication started coming, they were literally trying to do everything they could to keep me together. But I feel like the medications did it opposite. I remember thinking when I was 17, I was like, this can't be normal. Why do I feel this way all the time? Why do I feel like I'll never be good enough? Why do I feel like this is never gonna end? And I would push my family away and I would push my friends away. And it ultimately led to me just self isolating and then self-medicating even worse. And that's when I started going outside of the medications. Once this was a poppy growing in Italy or Turkey or some other hot land. The dried juice of this plant produces opium, a powerful drug. Contained in opium is morphine, used by doctors to relieve severe pain. From morphine comes heroin, outlawed even medically from the United States. These and other derivatives form the group of drugs called opiates. Opiates are classed as depressants. An overdose causes unconsciousness, then death. A smaller dose taken into the bloodstream inhibits all the functions of the body by its action on the brain and the central nervous system. But the body gradually builds up a tolerance to the drug. More and more is needed to produce the same effects. After continued use, the body acquires a physical dependence on opiates, so that withdrawal of the drug causes a brief but violent illness until the body can make a readjustment. Things as, as, as nasty as, as meth bugs and things like that, where people literally feel that their bugs are crawling onto their skin because they're so, they'll, um, things that are documented cases and has actually happened in this area where people come in and actually will keep urine in a bottle. And then when other inmates come in to try, they'll sell that urine to them because they still get something out of the urine because of their high. After that, I had custody of my daughter, my two year old daughter. Uh, we came into a lot of money over that, into a lawsuit because of a lawsuit and um, being involved in drugs and alcohol already, um, I just went um, into it worse than I ever had in my life. So anyway, all the money run out, drugs run out. She ran out, took the two girls with her. And uh, cooking my own meth. Uh, and of course, my son had came and uh, to visit me. Uh, and he had a girl with him. Of course, I kept all my chemicals and all the stuff I needed out in the woods. And, but anyway, as soon as we got out of the car, he just started running around like something just uh, crazy. Uh, and by the way, I never told this story but a couple of times because I, I knew nobody believed me. We're just like something in the movies. And all of a sudden, something throwed her 15 to 20 feet in front of that vehicle and began whooping her literally in front of my eyes. I couldn't believe it. And I kept telling my son, 
to go down there and help her because I was too, I, I was too scared to go near her. And by the time it was done, she had busted mouth, a black eye, and a busted nose. And she didn't even know what had happened to her. But I knew then, I look back on it now, and I think that's when the Lord was calling, was, was calling me. He was getting my attention because it wasn't very long. I, after that, I went back to jail. And then I went back to prison for the third time. Um, in, um, basically, incarceration is not making any change. Um, we have, uh, it's amazing that when I was at the police department, you would see the same names. Now that I'm at the task force, it's the same names. And the only time that you don't see the names is actually when they're incarcerated. And then as soon as they get out, it's amazing within a week, they're back in the game. Um, and it's the same names time and time again. So incarceration is, is, is not working. That, that's not anything new. We all, we all know that. I was arrested over 28 times in three years. Uh, stupid things. Um, I even had my own designated police officer. Uh, it was the only man I would listen to. His name was Ben Moore. He was the only one that could get me in the car without me throwing a fit. So it was, yeah, it was, it was that bad. I had my own police officer. This drug issue, and, and come set, come set where I do, set up where you get to look down and get to see people and meet people from different walks of life. Good people. If you just take the time to get to know them, this issue is this drug issue is so much bigger. Um, I was an addict from the time I was 18 till I was 38 years old for 20 years. Um, I have three boys. Whether it was legal or not, it was not good. And we, the family all tried to explain to him how it was a gateway drug, which then left, led to meth, uh, heroin, then the fentanyl. May 10th, I got up that morning for work and found him in the floor. He was passed out cold. When I got him up and conscious, I told him that, that, that him and his brothers would, would carry me to my grave, that I would not bury them, and that they had better straighten their life up. Little did I know that on um, May 10th that there would be a knock at the door that morning at 3.30. I don't wish this on any, any mother to ever, ever go through. Ben was gone. And to find God myself, I struggled with that. And it's helping me become more able to identify things um, as far as forgiveness of things that I did during my addiction, things that I did to my children, things that I did to myself, my family. It's everywhere. It's every family. It's every demographic. It's everything. Um, Hayden Burns, I'm 21. I'm from Mount Pleasant, Tennessee. I have some charges for evading arrest, uh, theft, over a, theft of a motor vehicle, uh, destruction of property, and drug paraphernalia. I lost my brother May 10th um, to an overdose, and I was lost. Uh, I didn't know which way to go. I ended up getting a bad batch of something, and I tried to kill myself. Um, being from that small town, our, we have a Dr. Joey Hensley here, and I'm sure he'll remember the voicemails that I left telling him that somebody was trying to kill me. Uh, many voicemails. That night, I attempted to take my own life and I ended up on life support for five days. When I did finally come to, I didn't have any permanent effects or anything like that, but I woke up to, I lost all three of my children. My my family was forced to file for emergency custody. Then I met my wife, and and uh, she wouldn't go out with me unless I went to church with her. So I went to church with her, and I guess she knew. Me and Jeff had been friends all our life. 
of course, met his wife, and, and, I, and I, was, I was even in the wedding, but Jeff gave his life to the Lord. Uh, and uh, I will never forget this, but they had invited me to uh, a service. And at that service at that time, I mean, I was just white knuckled. The Lord was calling me then, uh, but I just didn't take the step. And Jeff uh, went on from there uh, living for the Lord, and he's been living for the Lord ever since, except I went the, the totally opposite direction. How I've gained even more of my knowledge, my brother was somewhat of, of a functioning drug addict. He could keep a job. Um, the problem is he would get on cocaine and it would destroy him and he would lose everything and be indebted to the drug dealers and confiscate all stuff, steal from his family members and just do terrible things. And then he would kind of get off the binge and very talented with trim and trees. So he always was able to keep a job as many of them do around here. The first marriage was spectacularly terrible. Second, my second marriage, my husband was a guard member of the Army. He was a military police officer. Experiences that he went through as struggling with PTSD. He didn't even realize that I was so deep in addiction. I was able to maintain a lifestyle that was completely normal on the outside. It looked like we had every single thing we ever wanted. It was amazing for us, except on the inside it wasn't. Um, my husband couldn't sleep, and um, eventually one night he caught me doing drugs in the garage because uh, he couldn't sleep either. So when he caught me doing that with a friend of mine, he started to do it, and I remember begging him. I remember, Randy, don't do it. Please don't do it. You're going to get addicted, and then we'll never get done. And I remember watching him do it for the first time, and when he did it for the first time, he was instantly hooked, uh, much more than I was. 2017, married her daughter. Uh, the niece that made me want to be a dad. I remember rocking her to sleep at night when she had a colicky stomach. I remember her lancing onto my finger. So to bury her was, was a bit overwhelming. Uh, Andy, my wife and I got into the worst argument we had ever had. Uh, we went to have the Easter supper, me and the girls with her mom and dad at their lake house in North Carolina. And <clears throat> came home and found the door locks changed. I felt, you know, 10 years of sobriety and walking that line and it still all went to pot. I'm gonna show you what it's like when I'm on it. And I went hell bent for torment. Ran from the pain. And what I should have been doing was running to God. We witnessed a whole lot of abuse and neglect. And I would be easy to blame it all on that, but when I got older, I knew what I was doing. I've come to learn that today, is that I chose, I gotta stop playing the blame game. I gotta stop playing um, the victim. Because at the end of the day, if I'm a victim, I'm always gonna be a victim. So I've learned to uh, let go of all those negative emotions that come with that. It's no excuse for me to hurt people just because I was hurt. As soon as I got into home walls, I had a needle in my arm again. Uh, almost within the hour that I got into home walls. And um, I didn't want it. And I remember thinking to myself, what are you doing? When he got arrested, my little girl called me. I got to do my phone call that night. And when I, she picked up the phone, she said, Mommy, Mommy, Mommy. God heard our prayers. Daddy's in Teen Challenge. Daddy's gonna get better. Oh, Mama, I'm getting my family back. My name is Marcy Dubois. I started using when I was 14. I made a lot of, uh, you know, bad choices that uh, opened me up to feel a lot of shame and guilt. Um, and that's what started the drug use, was um, using drugs and alcohol to cover up those feelings of shame. Father passed away in 2012, my mom in 2014, and the pain from that loss um, took my addiction into a completely different realm of darkness. Um, if somebody asked me if I had tried um, acid, and I said no, and they'd asked if I wanted to, the answer was yes. Trying meth for the first time, after I lost custody for my kids, five months I was homeless, living out of my car, um, had lost anything that I had tried to build back up. Um, I wound up living in the woods out behind a Home Depot in Hickory, North Carolina, in a shanty I built out of three pallets, a, a hospital mattress I found out in the woods, 10 coffee can to hold a candle, 
it was winter and it got bad. My birthday, 2019, I remember laying there getting ready to go to sleep. I remember cursing God that if this is all that there was left to me, if this was all that there was left for me to be, then I didn't want to wake up sucking air again. I didn't want to see another sunrise. I was tired of the failures. I was tired of it. The truth of the matter was, it wasn't his fault, it was mine. It was consequences of my bad choices, my bad decisions. And I got up, I got dressed, walked out of the woods, stepped off the curb behind the Home Depot, heading to up the same road, putting in applications, heading for Salvation Army by the end of the day to get something to eat, maybe a shower. Walked 30 yards on the asphalt, and the man passed me, turned around and came back and gave me a job detailing cars where I worked for four and a half months living in a tent behind the shop. And that wasn't, that wasn't enough, but I think that's where this journey really began, was there. There was a jailer that was working there, and he would come in every morning at three o'clock in the morning, whistling. And I can hear him now, and I thought, who in the world would be whistling coming to work here? But he would bring me scriptures. And of course, at first, I didn't want to have anything to do with it. I actually had told him, I said, you know, you're wasting your time. Uh, it's not for me. Uh, I know how I'm going to leave this world, and uh, you're, you're, you're just wasting your time. Don't bring me no more scriptures. But lo and behold, he, he kept bringing them. And finally, just one early morning, uh, he'd brought a scripture, and I'd read it, and there's something just come over me, and I... I was, I just asked the Lord, I said, Lord, if you're real, please show me something. Uh, I really need to see something, if you're real, uh, because I've, I'm at my end, and I can't do this anymore. And then the Lord started changing me right then and there. I started reading my Bible, and of course, I didn't even know what I was reading the first probably six to eight months because uh, I just couldn't understand what I was reading. So I started praying to the Lord. I said, Lord, you got to help me keep reading it. It's, it's alive. It's, it's, it's going to come to you. And that's what I did. Uh, of course, after I gave my life to the Lord, I still had to go do four more years in the penitentiary. I took full advantage of it. And I read that Bible for four years. I tell these young guys that's wanting to get into ministry, you'll never have your own vision till you push another man's. So I did that for 25 or 26 years. I was been a pipe fitter all my life. And one day sitting at the computer, God asked me, he said, would you give all of this up for me? And I said, yes, Lord. And, and then he said, I, I really mean it. And I told me, I don't know about that. I said, yes, Lord, I will. TVA, I was working with them at the time. I'd been there 15 years. They had never offered an early out to anybody younger than 55. And when I told the Lord I would do that, during that process, my uncle called me and said, I need assistant pastor, would you be interested? And I said, I'll pray about it. Two weeks later, they called all of us to the, to the auditorium and said, we're gonna do something we've never done. And they offered an early out, and I was the first one to sign up. I left there making more money than I'd ever made in my life and came here making probably less money than I've ever made in my life. Six months after I was here, my uncle walked in one day and said, I'm leaving. He was the pastor here and laid it in my lap. And that's what I've been doing for the last nine years. Well, when I, when I got out of prison uh, this last time, uh, of course, I didn't know what the Lord wanted me to do, but I knew I wanted to give the Lord a, a, a year of my life before I did anything else or got involved in anything else. And of course, I started coming to church here at Blondie because uh, I knew he was pastoring here. And, uh, and because of all of what's been going on in our city, the Lord put it on my heart as a pastor that something had to be done. When he gets that vision, he's very obedient and he'll say, we're gonna do this, we're gonna step out in faith, and we'll wait and the provisions will come. It all comes back to one thing, the love of God and the heart of the people that love them, even no matter how bad they are, we just love them where they're at until God changes them. I've, I've met when I was chief, I know I came out to Blondie at least once, and I went to some other churches, 
and pretty much just talk to them as, as chief of police. We can't handle the problem, law enforcement, the courts. And I know that you've talked to the judge and I, I know Judge Henson, I know Judge Spitzer, and I think both of them would, would, would adamantly agree that it's not something that law enforcement and the courts can handle. Um, you know, I'm not saying that our way is the best way, but it's a way that we have in the United States for the court system, whether you like it or don't like it, set that aside, we can't handle. Each community is struggling with this drug issue. Each community is struggling with addiction. Each community is struggling with dealing with, and, and dealing with the drug dealers. Um, and as it's already been explained, law enforcement is having an issue. It's not that they don't want to do it, that they are not trying and not attempting, um, but it's gonna take the community as a whole. We can't just put it on law enforcement. Because of the burden in my heart, God put it on, on our heart to start trying to bring the churches together. And we here at Blondie actually went around and started calling pastors and saying, can we come and bring our congregation to your church on Sunday nights? We did that for about a year, and we went and visited other churches trying to build unity. The judge in this community, Judge Mike Henson. I've been in Hornwall for a little, well over half a century, and I've been judge since 2014. And then while I was practicing law and serving on the city council as well, uh, that's when all the meth labs came in. I saw what it was doing to the kids, saw what it was doing to the families, I saw what it was doing to our town, and um, it just it stuck right here. He was a morning help with addicts, and he knew that me and Brother Tim Collum had been going to the jail, we'd been visiting them. To defend myself as a chief, are we making a dent? I could show you on paper, look at the cases we've made, but then again, we've made the cases, you look over here and the same people are doing the same thing. So obviously it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure it out. We were not making a dent. And we were all having the same conversation. It was probably uh, around 2017 that a, a local judge uh, went around to every church building in Lewis County and attached a letter to the door of every building in the county. And that letter was simply, uh, it was two things. It was an appeal to the congregations of our community that there was a, a drug epidemic going on and uh, that there was no law, no legislation that could, that could control this. And that letter was actually signed by not only that judge, but it was signed by our mayor uh, of Hohenwald. It was signed by the, the county mayor of Lewis County. It was signed by the sheriff and the chief of police. And so those local officials were appealing to congregations. Before the courthouse meeting, one of the judges met with us and he made a statement. He said, I'm tired of seeing four courtrooms and empty churches. And he's right about that. It's a spiritual root and a spiritual problem. It takes us coming together as, as one people and nobody's losing their distinctiveness. You know, we, we're still the dwelling place, we're different. Our service will be very different than Greg's service, but our heart for God's not different. But it was also an invitation to a couple of meetings that were gonna take place at uh, the local courthouse and just one at a time they started coming and we started meeting. I remember being in a community meeting one night and Jeff saying, we're trying to put something together, we're trying to build something, we don't even know what we're looking for yet. Can we continue to let three to five people a week overdose and multiple people dying a week? That's what we're averaging here. I mean, it's every day nearly that somebody o o overdoses and we're losing two to three a week on average here. We just decided we can't continue to let the enemy take that many people out. And you know, we just lost a high school senior to, to, to drugs in this community. And that young man did not mean to, to die. What was really the selling point for me that kind of pushed me over the top was I had three, three guys between the age of 18 and 21. I had gone to school with all their fathers. I knew the grandfathers, grandmothers. I knew their family. I knew they were good boys. The dealers seem to do their time in its business. They do their time in jail. Then when they get out, they're back doing what they do, which is different than that. The addicts are, are asking for the help. They want to not be an addict. And I'll be honest with you, maybe I'm a little hardened towards the dealers in my line of work, 
not not as a pastor, but as a, because they don't seem to want help. It, it's a business. And because of these these drug dealers that are bringing this this laced, they bring pills in here that are laced. They bring drugs in here that that are not what they seem to be. And we just made a decision. We're not going to allow that to happen. Okay, we just gotten tired of uh, losing people every week to the drug addiction and the different things that uh, these addictions uh, cause. And we got tired of it burying our young folks uh, every week, uh, seeing somebody at the funeral home. But I said, I'm going to court every week, and I'm seeing really good people who are struggling. And I said, right now, I've got three boys I'm trying to get out in front of this and trying to save their life. We're tired, tired of seeing our young people go to an early grave. The users being used by the dealers, um, for one thing, there's the intimidation factor, and, and a lot of times they won't give them up. Um, you know, a, a little bit different with with the task force having having agents that that we we have the time and focus just on doing that. When I was the chief, we had guys that would make drug cases, but having to take a two-man unit, which that's, you have to do a minimum of a two-man unit, we just didn't have the personnel to do it. So it was hard for us to actively pursue on up the chain, and that's what you have to do to be able to get the drug dealers. But even today, it's, it's getting harder and harder. You know, we've had, we've had death threats. We've had people, you know, you know, tell everybody, we're gonna kill you, but this is the deal. They're not taking us out until God gets ready. I would say he's probably a David. Um, he goes after something kind of like David and Goliath. There's nothing that's too big. A lot of the drug dealers are not addicts. They're not addicts. Um, they're, they're dealing drugs. It's a business and it's amazing to me. I always thought they were addicts, but they're not. They, they just work on intimidation. You know, there's some now where, where drugs are coming from the next community over and you have uh, somewhat of a, of a cartel. They can make any threat they want to make. We're not scared. We're not going to back up. We've made our mind up. We're going to take our city and there's nobody can stop it. Hell itself can't stop us from taking our city as long as we stay unified. It was real personal with me and I mean I've lived here so long and like I say everybody's been so good to me. I just I take it to heart because I know and I remember going to church camp as a child and there was a song that we sang, a campfire song that was, uh, the words were, it only takes a spark to get a fire going. And I thought here in Hohenwald, we could be that spark. So I guess about the last two and a half to three years, um, this thing has taken root and taken hold. The, the reason for forming that coalition was to try to combat the drug epidemic that was going on in our community. We started meeting as pastors and that that's what kind of what birthed the Lewis County Faith-Based Recovery Coalition. I'm the pastor here at New Hope Baptist Church. I've been here since 1981. It's wonderful to be able to have the uh, prayer service at the city hall. The coalition in my view is something that that we were told would never happen. There's pastors all over this community that said, you'll never see these, this church or that church come together because there's too, many, too much difference in their beliefs. But there's something that's, it's, it's one of the most powerful things I've ever been a part of in my life, that through God and His power and His presence showed man that I'll do it my way when I want to. And what he's done here is something that we were told could not happen. And he's brought different non denominations together. And we chose not to worry about the, the things we didn't agree on. And we just uh, decided we're gonna agree on one thing. Jesus is the answer. And that's all that matters. And anything other than that, we don't worry about it. We've never had the first argument. It's all about unity, love, and we are the watchmen of this community and we have to save our community. The only way to do that is to love God, love each other. Uh, the nation of Israel was 12 distinct individual tribes. And when it was time to do war, they came together as one nation. And we don't need to take the names off above the church doors, that's fine. We're, our hearts are in aligned in a special way. We elected officers and we started the ball rolling. Um, it's a spiritual battle. Um, it, it, 
it, it's a spiritual nightmare. Um, the evil forces are uh, abound, but we have the light. We have the light here in home. And we have the light of the Lord and the spark begins with us. You need to start showing more love to people. And not only that, you need to tell them because I had lost a loved one and it, it, it just hurt me to the core because I never did tell them I loved them. So God put it on my heart to change. And I started telling people that I loved. And it's, it's really called on around here. God put it on my heart as a pastor to talk to Stick Collin and ask him to start a recovery through Christ class. He didn't really want to do it at first. He was real nervous, but he agreed to do it. And uh, he started out with three people and people just started slowly coming. And I think the reason they started coming is they seen something in this town that they've never seen before. A love for people that were unlovable. And that's what Brother Tim offered. That's what this, this community started offering, this church. And now we're running anywhere from 60 to 80 people on a Sunday night to a Recovery Through Christ class. So that class uh, turned into be Recovery Through Christ. And of course, I facilitate that class. Overcome the slavery of addiction. My name is Kim King. I'm an accountant. And I have been sober for seven years. Um, started selling meth and I was a daily drug user. What caused me to stop was I went to jail and I had a warrant uh, for drug sales. And when I got out of jail, I found out that my son had been using meth and he was 17 years old. And when I found that out, I just prayed and I was like, Lord, I can't, I'm done. Like, I don't wanna do this anymore. This is what it's caused to happen that my son is a drug addict, then I don't want no part of this. And so I just started coming to Blondie Church. They're, they're not used to the love. So even in our recovery through Christ, uh, I made it known from, from the very start that, that, that they could even come high. Being recovered and giving their life to the Lord is actually the new high. It's, that's what the new high is now. Instead of getting high on drugs, we're getting high on Jesus. I think getting to that place of desperation, of, um, you know, I looked at a, a bag of Xanax bars, I thought to myself, I could take those and this would all be over. And, um, and then I, instead of taking those, I took a nap, so that was good. <laughs> um, but when I woke up, I, uh, I called a friend of mine that she worked at a Christian school that my son had gone to. And she um, was always so nice to me and so kind to me, no matter what shape I was in, no matter how I looked, no matter if she could tell if I was drinking or not. I mean, she always treated me the same. And it was just the love of Jesus that came, that would come out of her. Um, nothing over the top, just kindness. And so I called her um, to ask her if I could come talk to her. And of course she said yes. And when I went and I was just telling her some things that was going on in my life, she looked at me and she said, are you ready to get help? And my response was yes. Uh, and of course, you know, that's where we have a group of pastors uh, from all different denominations uh, that's got one goal, and that's to save lives. As we started this prayer, I don't think initiative is the right thing. We started to meet um, as several pastors and several members of churches a couple times a week. And just that's all we do is pray for our community, especially with being able to handle and see some victories. Of course, the very hard thing is that you still see some defeats. When you, when you invest in people so heavy and then you see them go through a program and, boy, you're, and then all of a sudden they get out and, and, and they fall and they, they get away. And, and unfortunately, sometimes there's been some that have died. I, I can see on, on Jeff Candy and the different ones on Six Faces when they, when they have to share these with us, uh, the hurt that it caused them. And the hurt that, it, that you feel that, um, that you have some defeats, but you know, you can't stop trying to do it. You can't stop investing in it. The thing about coming together as pastors and forming a coalition is there's a, such a power and anointing that comes from it. And what we found is 
we come together wanting to help people and we start off talking and, and we'll, have, we'll have young men come in and give testimonies. And before the night's over, the whole house is wrecked. Men and women preachers are just crying and weeping over our city. And, and God, God sees that, that moves God. And, and what we find is every, every month is different when we meet. And what we end up doing before it's over, every preacher in the house takes turns and we just, every one of them will pray. And it's just like the presence of God just, just hovers in. And it's such a, a joy to a pastor to be able to get away from all the grind and all the stuff we have to fool with. I remember it was like, it was torture. We couldn't even stay clean for four days to see our kids. We would try so hard. We would start on Tuesday and uh, by Friday, I was having to call my mom and tell her that I can't see them because I, I could never make it to Friday. I could never make it to Friday. I remember my little girl, Elena, she would, mama, when are you gonna stop this? And I'm like, honey, I'm almost there. So I would tell her that every single time I got to see her. I'm almost there, baby girl, I'm almost there. It's not that I don't want you, it's just, this is so hard. I was uh, raised until I was 10 years old by a functioning alcoholic father when I was 10. And, and at that night, this is how I woke up. Yeah. Uh, bring my babies to me, I'm dying. We're up out of the bed and I look at him and he just lays back and he's gone. In, in my little mind, it was, I knew he loved me, I was a daddy's girl, but he had chosen something else over me. And so it marked my life uh, deeply to those who are addicted with drugs or alcohol. And then also, um, I'm a nurse by training, and um, so I've always had just that heart of compassion uh, to, to minister to people who are in that bondage. I remember Judge Henson telling me when he had to sign the order to sign my children away from me and then send me to another jail, he said, I'm tired of seeing you completely crap your life away, Susan. You've got to do something different. I'm not letting you out of jail until you go to rehab. We try to let the public know that this is a safe place to come, that you can, you can put it all out on the table. All we're gonna do is love on you. We're not, we're not gonna judge. The day that everything changed for me, uh, I remember reading through, it was Acts. These promises are for you too. And that was the day things started to change for me. I had been faking it all the way up until that point, following the rules, keeping my head down, staying out of trouble. And you can graduate that program that way, but I didn't want to. I wanted God to change me. I read this sentence in a book and it said, it was the forgiveness books and it said, how many times have you forgiven yourself? Well, before then I had never forgiven myself. So that was a process for me to learn from that. And then there was also another little short sentence at the end of that chapter and it said, have you forgiven God for your disappointments that you've had to experience? And I'll never forget, it was like warm hot liquid was poured over my head and he put my little duct tape heart right back together. And I felt it right then and there. And from that day forward, I began to walk changed and you could see it. All I wanted was to be reunited with my kids. That was the one thing that just kept over and over again. I missed him so much. Um, you know, I'm praying and trying to figure out all the details of how that's gonna look. And it's, he just stopped me and he said, I'm not giving them back until you can show me that you can provide a stable environment for them. And I had never thought about the process of um, what that would look like. You know, I had no idea what stability looked like. Drug addicts and alcoholics really have a lot to say. They just don't have many people to listen. A Christian family that just, um, that loved Jesus and had a heart for the lost. And they, when I was telling them that I, you know, my lease was up in Columbia and I was trying to find a place to live, they offered their studio apartment that was attached to their house. I moved down here, um, got uh, partial custody of my kids back when I moved down here. Um, um, a real estate agent, I worked for a title company. My dad had a title company in Columbia. 
for many years and I worked there for 10 years, years ago. And so um, a judge here, Judge Henson, he had mentioned to a real estate agent that he wanted to open up a title company. And so an agent that I worked with in Columbia all those years ago reached out to me and asked me if I wanted to get back in the title business. And so she set up an interview with Judge Henson. He didn't know me at all. Um, I didn't know him. And um, he took a chance on me, starting up a company with me and giving me free reign. That's, you know, someone that at one point in my life couldn't be trusted with anything. You know, God just put put it on his heart to, you know, say, let's open a business together. You know, like that's, <laughs> how does that happen? For my entire life, I think I had had this victim mentality of, um, look at what all these people have done to me. Like, well, look what happened to me and poor pitiful me. My life was in the shape that it was in because of the choices that I made that got me there. And we have opened a title company with myself, um, Rob Inman and, and the judge. And it's been, um, it's been incredible. Just coming to the meetings and experiencing what the Lord is doing in this community and how it's grown from me driving around, picking the people up. I have a friend who just started coming to the meetings and I've been trying to get her to come for years. And she finally came and she told me, she was like, that's like no other meeting I've been in my whole life. She said, I've been to meetings all over in different states, different counties, and nothing is like the Recovery Through Christ program. I said, I try to tell you, like you needed to come to that meeting, that it's amazing. And so she gave her life to the Lord and she got baptized about three weeks ago. We would raise funds then, and then we would send people off to treatment centers in different parts of our state, what were essentially 12-month faith-based programs. We even got to a point where we were gonna build a two-bedroom, one or two-bedroom facility we drove all over the country looking at other facilities, trying to figure out how to do it. And we couldn't even build a one or two room facility for people. God, it was like God just closed the door everywhere we went. People donated land to us and we still couldn't make it happen. We came to realize that the, the group that we seemed to work best with was Hope Center Ministries. Then we began sending most of our people into Hope Center Ministries. The one thing that I remember laying in jail just, I didn't know where they were, how to get in touch with them. And that old thing in the back of your head, you should have been thinking about that while you were doing it, when you had the chance. That time in jail was God's way of taking me, setting me down, saying, sit down, shut up and listen. I know what we have here is love. Uh, we have Jesus love here uh, for anyone that comes. I was at a point to where I just wanted to be done with it. Uh, I was tired of living. I had heard of Hope Center. About the time I was bottoming out, I'd heard of Hope Center. So at the point where I was ready to just be done with it and commit suicide, I thought, you know, I'll at least try it. I'll at least try the Hope Center. And if this guy's for real, it's gonna work. And sitting there drunk and high, I'm crying out to God saying, Lord, if you're for real, Please turn my life around. Help get me in the Hope Center and turn my life around. And so I call the first time, phone's ringing, somebody shows up in my house and I hang phone up. Second time, a few hours later, I'm calling the Hope Center. It's ringing, somebody else pulls up and I hang the phone up. And then the third time before I called, I said, Lord, um, if it don't work this time and I can't get through to them, I'll just go ahead and be done with it and end my life. So I'm calling and about the fourth ring or fifth ring, I'm thinking, oh Lord, I'm gonna have to go through with this. The fourth or fifth ring and the man um, picks the phone up and told me who he was. Um, when I introduced myself to him, he knew who I was because I was a hometown guy and they knew my story and he was excited uh, wanted to get me in the center told me they had a bed read for um, a bed ready for me and so we set up an interview i went up there and that's where it all took off um, i got into the hope center and they taught me when i went through the door they taught me how to have an everyday relationship with jesus that would change my life 
someone who is an addict has burned bridges in their family. They've burned bridges with parents and grandparents and siblings. Uh, they have lost their jobs. Uh, in a lot of cases, uh, you saw uh, failed marriages as, at, at, as a result of their addiction. My name is Daniel Cheney. Uh, I came to the Hope Center, to be honest, because I didn't want to die. I was dying of a drug overdose. Um, and my younger brother had died and um, got to the point where I didn't want to want to live anymore. Uh, they didn't even have the funds to initially get into Hope Center. And so the purpose of the Faith-Based Recovery Coalition is that we would simply provide those initial funds and then we would stay in touch with them and kind of follow their progress. One of the pastors in our group, Sam Livingston, you know, uh, we're sending people from here to other places, uh, sending them to places like Waverly and Dixon and Camden, Tennessee. And, you know, at some point, maybe it's a good idea if we had a center here ourselves that uh, where, where people in other communities could send someone here. Because a lot of times when you've battled addiction, uh, being in recovery in your local community is not a good idea. A lot of times going off somewhere uh, is really what works best. But once God's timing came in line with what we were trying to do, overnight it birthed one of the most amazing things I've ever been a part of in my life, which is building hope centers in Lewis County and giving this community a hope that it's never had, that there's somebody here that'll love you, take care of your kids, and help you find a way to Jesus. That's what the Hope Center brings here, and that's what the coalition brings. And I'm convinced that none of this would be possible without the unity of all of these preachers coming together. And I've been able to get them into a system through using jail for using Tim or other folks. And, and thank God for the Hope Center. And I came to the center and that's whenever over in Camden and I realized that I couldn't do my recovery out in Camden because it was too close to my hometown. And so whenever Richie was asking for people to come out this way, I volunteered as the first phaser in the program because I was about 21, 30 days inside, and but I knew that I couldn't do my recovery there. The people from Hope Center Ministries wanted to put a, a center in Hohenwald, and Jeff Gandy, uh, I think, expressed that, hey, we've got something a little different here. We've got a recovery coalition, and uh, Hope Center Ministries responded, and I can understand why, saying that, you know, that's not how we work. We really want to partner with one individual church. And so the Blondie Church and their leaders uh, took a leap of faith, and they made a significant investment in order to bring Hope Center Ministries to Owenwald. Uh, but uh, there are so many churches, so many congregations locally that uh, have members and have, have ministers that are involved with what's going on at Hope Center Ministries. With our Hope Center, a lot of our men that have come, they have no family. When they come here, they're broken. You can tell. Sometimes they won't even look at you in the eyes. And I look at them, and as soon as they come in, we introduce ourselves, we give them a hug, and we tell them we love them. They become, it's just like part of our family. Uh, I treat them like they're my kids. And the guys, they grow, that's their brothers. So when they get ready to graduate, they don't wanna leave, they wanna stay here. And we just have to remember that, and we have to love people. And when we do have the setbacks, we gotta remember there's so many more out there who are trying. Uh, what brought me to the Hope Center was I had caught a aggravated burglary charge October 30th last year. Um, at the time, I was doing the most in my life and while I was in addiction instead of being the man that I'm supposed to be doing and brought me out to the Hope Center because we had a talk and I was ready to get off drugs, but I just didn't know the way to get off drugs without this program. If we can love people enough and we can open doors and we can give them all the tools they need and say, here it is, this door is wide open. I love you, we're gonna be here on the other side, we're gonna do whatever. 
God is my witness. I gave it up for it. I traded it off. It's not until it costs so much in a trade that you're not willing to give that you wake up. And that moment came sitting in Lewis County Jail about two months after I was arrested the second time in 2020. So I was arrested in 2020. And that's what led to bringing me to the Hope Center. Eight months. In jail, I finally got my hands on a Bible. As someone was being escorted out of the Lewis County Jail, because a judge had signed off on them being released from jail and going to a, a into a long-term faith-based rehab program. The, the look that they would have when they come out of jail and then the look that they would have when you would see them 30, 45 days later was the, the transformation was unmistakable. He had been here just a couple of weeks and he got baptized. And I said, how do you feel? And he said, for the first time in my life, he said, I feel joy, I'm happy. I've never had that before. And that's something that they can have here. I fell back heavily into using because uh, I really wanted to end it. And I don't have the uh, gall to, I did not have the gall to do it any traditional way. So I was just figured if I do enough, it'll blow me up, blow my heart up if I do enough. So actually what led me is I was on a way to get some and I got pulled over and I went to jail and I got a call from the Hope Center, the liaison, my lawyer had called her. So I was talking to him and Ashley interviewed me. And when she interviewed me, it was just like, a, I just knew in my spirit uh, some told me I should try the hopes and I should go. Of course, I came uh, thinking that I'm just going to BS my way through this like I have everything in my life. After just a month or so in the program, is you saw light return to their eyes. And that light was not there when they walked out of jail. But it's when you get here to the property, you can feel the love in the house. Feeling the love that the people put off here, that they, they take time of their day to just come and pour into our lives. Never had that experience that in my life from anybody. Well, when I first got here, I was, I was, I was still high. I've been up for like 14 days. I was coming down and Chase and uh, some people, uh, Doug and Dante, they just came in the car and greeted me with open arms and love. I ain't never had a bunch of brothers, like 27 guys, just show me love like they do. They're there for me when I need them. Uh, when I, if I need somebody to talk to, three o'clock, four o'clock in the morning, today, I can go talk to them. Two weeks ago, I got wrapped my arms around my baby girls for the first time since August 2008. But what I'm learning here is that uh, I have an identity, and that's in Jesus Christ. Uh, so when, when life does hit me, if my family breaks up, if family members die, if anything happens, that doesn't change who I am. And though I'm not blown from here or there, I become, I become solid. Because I've always been a self-centered person. The more I, the more I stay here and do this program, the more, I, the more I, I, I can focus on myself and, and love that they have. Mm -hmm. That is, you know, it's all, it was always there. It's, it's never unfailing. Uh, my name's Malik Dunlop. 13, 14 years old, I started drinking, smoking weed. My cousin came to my house on a Friday afternoon, I believe. And he told me I had two options. I can either live the lifestyle I'm living or I can get help. And I chose that help, and he paved my way to the Hope Center and Horn Mall. Uh, some of them have never had a dad in their life. Um, they never had a role model, a male role model in their life. Seeing these guys become um, the husbands and fathers they should be. Uh, that's one of my biggest regrets um, as a father is that I wasn't there for my children the way I should have been. After my first 30 days, uh, my son's mother and my son came to a Wednesday night class. And that was the first time I've seen him in a year and a half. I'm able to show them the true father that I can be because I grew up without a father. The only, visit, the only time I ever seen my father was in was in prison, was in uh, visitations. That's a special part of doing this, is I want these guys to get it, that 
you know, you're not getting that time back with your children, but what time you have from here on, you can make it really, really special. God's given me a desire to be the father that my son needs, and not like the father that I had. I may make them mad, and uh, they may think I'm a little rough on them, but I want these guys to get it. I do want them to go home to their, their wife, and I do want them to go home to their children and be the men they're supposed to be. It's no excuse for me to hurt people just because I was hurt, and that's what I did my whole life. I used my past and what happened to me as a child and my reason to take, steal, and use other people for what they could give me, what they could do for me or normal as I thought it was because I didn't know what normal was. Uh, I didn't know what love was. I didn't know how to love. I didn't know that uh, families actually cared for you. Uh, and then not only when you hear it, but you see it. You don't just speak it. Uh, I got to go spend 10 hours at home with my family. And all uh, me and my grandmother, all we did was just ride around in three different counties. And I, they started getting like three, three, three o'clock, two o'clock. I started feeling my anxious, my anxiety started going up to the, to the roof. And out there, it's just, it's, I'm not ready for that side world yet. Deion Robinson, for me, having the brothers at the Hope Center, it means the world to me because, you know, there are sometimes you may not get along with them because you're 28 guys living in a house. But when those days when you're struggling, we're all from so many different walks of life that there's not one person you could probably, you know, you could be struggling with one individual thing, but you got 10 other brothers that can give you advice on how to handle it. I talked to my brothers about how I had my day and how the anxiety got to me and how the urge of wanting to use again, it just, it started going high. And so I decided to come on back home to my safe zone. Cause you know, we're all, we've all been there together for a while so we can read each other pretty well. As soon as one of them sees that you're having kind of an off day, you know, they're there in an instant to check on you. As soon as I get out of the truck from work, I have five brothers saying, hey, how was your day? How was your day? And you know, they can, no matter how much you try to hide it, you can just be like, good. And they're like, what's wrong with you, you know? Genuine love and compassion and care from people in this community that don't get paid a dime to come out and do anything. They don't get to write it off on their taxes at the end of the year. It's not, uh, it's, they just do it because they feel the call of God to help out. I've been here almost four months. I can feel God was working more and more into my life and just, he's pouring into me more than he would on the outside of my life. He's, um, he's taught me how to say things. He taught me how to pray. I, I didn't know how to pray when I got here. And the brother here just told me, just talk to him as you would talk to, uh, just talk to a friend. That's one thing I liked about high school because everybody came from a different area coming together and it was just, it was so awesome getting to just hear their stories and then everybody, because I don't judge from what people used to be. I just know who they are now. Being a part of the Hope Center where I'm at now, as far as being a house manager, they come together and lay aside their differences and just are, are only focused on the weightier issues, saving lives and helping people. For the success stories, we, we have had some that, some that didn't make it. But uh, you know, you just, you mourn those and uh, you get back up and, and, and you focus on the ones who have. It saved my life. It saved my children. It's trickling out into the community. It's trickling out into the congregations. And I have people all over town stop me in the stores and walk up and whisper, thank you for what you and those men of God are doing. And that's what's happening in this city. And, You'll never see God do what he needs to do in your community until churches come together in love and unity and one purpose, God's will, not ours. They see a change in some particular lives that live here, and they're saying to themselves, I want some of that. Well, I don't, I don't think a lot of people are genuine, and there's just not many places that... Uh, this is going on. You know, I've been around, I mean, of course, there's all kinds of rehabs and rehabilitation centers, but I just think we really have something special here. Uh, and his name's Jesus. Take a knee in front of the rest of the guys at Family Support there at the Live Center that Friday night that I got to see my kids for the first time. And take a vow before God and my brothers in Christ and tell my children that never again would they have to ask where daddy's at. 
is daddy okay? And does daddy love me? So I do have a relationship with my older daughter. Um, after I got sober, I got custody of all three of the girls. Uh, my older daughter went on and moved out. The two younger girls, when I got custody of them, they've stayed with me. Uh, one of them is a sophomore at Union in Jackson, Christian University, and the other one just graduated this year. Even though God opened the door for us to minister to men to begin with, I knew the women were right there behind them. And even if it was a male who was in, uh, you know, in recovery at that time, he's left behind sometimes, or most of the time, a wife and children. And in that part, I can come in and I can step into that space. But now as we're going to uh, open this house for females, it's going to open a, a new opportunity there. Like the Hope Center. In little Lewis County, Tennessee, we got a men's facility that starts with 12 or 16 people in January, something like that. And in less than a year, for the first time in that, that organization's history, they're going to put a female facility there my name is Christy Warren. Um, I got into addiction at 14 years old. I came to Hope Center whenever I was 37. The big change came. I feel like whenever I felt like that she saw something in me that I didn't see in myself. That's when I started to see my worth, seeing that I was worthy to do this. I was worthy to to be a leader in this program, to, to be over a group of women. Months in the program, my heart started changing. She made me a house leader, and she had asked me to come and help her open that center. And it's just like God just kept opening doors. I stayed with Hope Center. I interned for a year. Um, I made the recovery coordinator position in Paris, Tennessee. And since then, it's been a desire of my heart to open a Hope Center in Linden or Holmwald. They're right beside each other. So I stepped into the director's position last year. You no, know, I know that they're building a women's facility um, and I, my passion is to absolutely help as many women as I can um, find their identity and who he is and who he says that they are. Over the last couple of years, we have seen people who should not be alive, they're alive. Because everybody else says it, I love God. I didn't know God because I didn't have a relationship with God. When I got that relationship with God, it was just like everything started falling into place for me. Like I, I started see, seeing restoration with my family, with my kids and there are mamas and daddies who have their kids back in their lives, and more importantly, there are kids who have mamas and daddies back in their lives. The advice that I would give addicts out there, uh, no matter how bad your addiction is, Jesus is bigger. And um, I tried every single thing that I could to get off of those drugs. I did everything that I could, but it wasn't until Jesus changed my heart and healed my heart that I was able to let go of those addictions. And one thing that we know about our Lord is that He is a complete gentleman. And then if you don't ask Him into every single dark space you have in your life, in your heart, in your mind, in your soul, if you don't be honest and give Him every single bit of that, He can't do anything with you. You're not letting Him. From ashes will be received every bit and the God of restoration will restore every single thing that the enemy took from you. Surrender your life from God to God. That's the only way. I'm Rodney Anthony, I'm 40 years old, and Hope Center was final straw for me. Now, for me, it's not about what I want to go do anymore. It's about me interning for the Hope Center, working for the Hope Center to help other lives. By the time I graduated my program, so I made a commitment to stay on with the ministry, and then my husband graduated his program. And we have uh, 
we went from every single thing that we owned being gone and losing everything to now having more than enough. We have everything that we lost back and then some. We have all three of our girls plus a bonus daughter. Uh, we have actually just got our pre-approval letter to buy another house. Um, and I can't tell you how bad our credit was after all of that. The, the very city that I was using in, I believe that God wants me to come back here and to trample on the enemy, to take beauty for ashes. And I'm on a six month internship right now to work for the Hope Center. Plan on being a director at the Hope Center one day. The renewing in my mind, I don't even think the same, I don't speak the same, I don't talk, I don't do nothing the same anymore. Everything about me's changed. I'm a totally different person now. I'm a new creation in Christ. Well, you know, we, we planned to march for November the 14th. And uh, I'm, I'm so excited because I believe there's gonna be a great turnout for it. I really do. And I think God's gonna use this to help, help us take our community back. Enough is enough. That's what we've, that's our slogan that we use. Enough is enough. And the, the number one thing I believe that comes out of it is it gives every pastor setting their hope. And if you're a pastor anywhere in the country and you don't have a coalition, you need one because it gives, it gives us a hope that I did, never dreamed would be possible. And I can personally say I leave after weeping and crying over our city, I leave every month knowing that God is going to give us our city because of that meeting and that unity and the presence that's in that room. This is definitely a hub of pastors and denominations and just completely squash um, anything of what, you know, it should, the people think it should look like and just ask God, you know, how, does, how do, can we help these people that need you? And how can we come together and show unity when there's all sorts of division everywhere we turn. And really, um, as this march is coming up, I, I've, I've never been a part of anything like this here in my life. Uh, this is the biggest thing I think we've been a part of in a community of a church that, I'll be honest with you, you don't see that often. Is this drug issue a huge problem in our community? I'd say it's probably the largest. I'm not gonna lie to you. Uh, but I honestly think that as we continue to pray, pray that every soul in Lewis County comes to know Christ. We don't look at each other like there's the Baptist preacher, or there's the holiness preacher. We look at each other as sons and daughters of God. I don't look at them as just pastors. They're my family and I love coming together. It's just like when you have Christmas. It's like having Christmas every, every month with your family. There's nothing more beautiful than a group of men and women that are pastors coming together and loving each other despite our differences. That's what God always wanted from the beginning, and He can work with that. And that would be my encouragement. If, if there's a wall that you can't tear down, you get you some pastors from different denominations, you come together and you love each other despite your differences, there's not a wall you can't break down when you do that. everything will be affected. The jobs, the economy, everything. And ministry is just being birthed a thousand directions in this city right now. I believe God started a movement here. Unity, God loves unity and God loves order over chaos, right? Hope does live here in Hole Wall, Tennessee. But we need everybody. We need that unity and, and it's happening. You can see a difference in them. There's a difference in me a big difference in me. With the march, I think you're gonna see it start all across the country and it's gonna break, it's gonna break the bondage. It's, it's gonna be like a domino effect and then you're gonna see another town and another town. And I think it's gonna help give other towns uh, a vision, hope that we are having so much feedback from like other counties, uh, other states that are wanting to know, what are you doing for your drugs and, and rehab? We know, you know, that you have a, a problem. What we're wanting it to do is spread out and not only help just people here in Homewall, but uh, people all across the country. And we accomplish God's will here in this town 
we can then be the inspiration and the spark that starts that fire in the other communities surrounding us. And then that, that fire can spread across the nation. The one thing that we want to say to the world is this, is that hope lives in Hornwall, Tennessee right now. And if God will give us our city, I can promise you if you'll come together in unity, love one another, put your differences aside, there's hope for you and God will give you your city because he loves you just like he loves us. And I, I just, the, the thing I want to stress the most, there is nothing impossible with God. And that's where we get our hope from. And I'm telling you right now, not only are we going to take our city back, we're taking our nation back. God is going to save America. So we see how a forest fire can start from a small little spark and devastate the land. But I envision this fire as a renewing fire to cleanse the land and to bring fresh vegetation. And as you know, sometimes it takes, it takes a fire to burn off the old and the dead so that the new can grow. And I, and I just see a vision of green, fresh, new life in Christ after this fire goes through. And you know, the enemy thought he had America and he thought he had Lewis County and he's beat us down for years and we've lost multiple people in this community. But we're headed into a season right now of grace that's being released over this community, over America, and you're about to see the hand of God rise up and slap the enemy down. And you, we're gonna get to see and live and see the greatest move of God and more people brought into the kingdom of God than we've ever seen in our lives. And that's what unity and love will do for you if you're willing to do it. The hope of Jesus Christ brings healing to the broken, freedom to the addicted, and salvation to the lost. Just as these brothers and sisters in Hornwall have shown us by their example, it really is our responsibility as the church to embrace the fight for our communities and do what governments cannot do, what social programs cannot accomplish to be the light to a lost and dying world. It's amazing what we can accomplish when we work together as one body under the banner of the church. So yes, hope lives in Hohenwald, but it also lives in your city, in your family, in your school, in your church. We just have to answer the call. Will you? Friend, today, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to bring you out of darkness into light. This can be the best day of your life. Jesus Christ can set you free, just like he did these men and women in this film. All you need to do is ask him to set you free. Just pray and say, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. Please forgive me of my sin. Break this bondage that I'm in. Come into my life. Set me free. Deliver me. Be my Lord, be my Savior, and He'll do it right now, today.
If you have